Hey, everybody, and welcome to the Startup Savant Podcast. I'm your host, Ethan, and this is a show about the stories, challenges, and triumphs of fast-scaling startups and the founders who run them. Our guest on the show today is John Gosha, founder and CEO of Native Voice, a company that's bringing all of your AI assistants together in harmony. John has a long history with entrepreneurship and has started several companies prior to Native Voice. He's currently chairman of the board at Lucidity Lights and a board member at a nonprofit called For All Moonkind. And you know, each of these businesses could probably fill an entire episode all on their own, but we just don't have the time to focus on them. So we're gonna put the links to those in the show notes and you can go check them out on your own time. And there's a ton that I wanna get into with John, but before I start, I wanna ask a favor of you. We would love it if you shared this podcast with your friends. Everyone here at Startup Savant puts in a ton of time, effort, and love into the show, and we wanna share it with as many people as possible. So pull off to the side of the road safely, find that share button on your podcast app, and rocket this episode over to your two best friends. I promise they'll appreciate you for the gift. All right, that's enough from me. Let's get some words from John Gosha of Native Voice. John, how are you doing today? Excellent, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming on. This is gonna be a lot of fun. Um, in the research, I uh, I stumbled pretty hard on uh, you know on your on your thoughts on AI and voice and that sort of thing. And we're definitely gonna jump into a bunch of that later in this episode. Um, but before we do, can you give us just a little bit of background on yourself and tell us the story of how entrepreneurship entered into your life? Sure. So. Uh... I guess it's it's in my blood, if you will. And so my father was an entrepreneur, my grandfather was an entrepreneur. And so I, I probably learned more playing on the floor of my dad's office growing up than uh, I really realized. But uh, I love consumer tech, I love consumer technology. And so uh, I've been fortunate to start three companies uh, in the past, uh, all different technologies, but in that same consumer tech space. But uh, I find that there's a gap between technology and market. And so a lot of technologies don't make it to market or don't make it to market in the right way. And so I love thinking about the application of technology. And so what kind of new technology, what big problem can it solve? And so that gap is where I've spent you know, most of my, uh, my career. I think that sounds like a pretty good place to find opportunities is to, uh, you know, go out to those CES events and, and find the newest technology that isn't making its way into the consumer's pocket. So yeah, good, uh, good on you. There was a, there was a business that you started in high school. Um, and it, <laughs> and it turned into a six figure business, which, you know, not a lot of high schoolers can, can talk, uh, talk about. Um, can you, can you give us the story of, uh, of your high school business? Sure. Well, uh, first of all, it, it made me trouble for my parents because uh, when your parents can't take your car away and when they say, you know, my rules are under my roof and you say, well, I'll get my own roof uh, right. because we're kind of a uh, <laughs> troublesome teenager. So sorry, mom and dad. But um, yeah, so uh, my golf company, I um, you know, originally started making uh, golf clubs and uh, you, know, you could just buy the components and you know, put them together in your garage. And um, you know, I discovered that I could start selling these uh, clubs online. And so uh, at the time, um, you could send like a million emails for $10. So yes, that was you know an early spammer. Sorry, everyone. Um, but it did generate a lot of traffic for my uh, golf club business. And it got to the point where I couldn't make the clubs. We had too many orders. And so uh, I had a nice system set up where the orders would come in, they would automatically get faxed to uh, golf club, uh, you know, custom club makers around the uh, city and they would ship out the product. So my job uh, at that point was just uh, doing marketing and running credit cards. And so uh, that was uh, the origin of the company. But um, you know, I decided that I didn't know about venture capital and that people would give you millions of dollars to go start companies. I thought you had to save up your money. And so uh, I saved up my money until I could start designing my own golf club. And so uh, we created a design that actually ended up becoming the, what was the R7 driver from TaylorMade. Really? And uh, for the golfers out there, yeah, if you brought, if you remember the Big Bertha, that was the number one selling driver in the market and the R7 displaced the Big Bertha. So that was a, a big deal and it became the uh, most winning club on the PGA Tour and uh, the best selling driver in the US and Europe. 
So uh, really happy to see that design kind of take flight. But uh, take that was flight. the uh, fantastic the golf the golf business. <laughs> you know, that's the that's the driver that I have in my bag is a is an R seven. Oh no way! Yeah, it is. Yeah. Um, now I I don't know if it's designed perfectly because I can't swing it worth a crap. So uh, I think you're going to need to go back and try again to make my golf swing a little better. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we could go back to uh, the golf business. It's a it's a fun business, but you also need to become a good golfer and uh, and learn that those two things don't mix together. Startups <laughs> and playing a lot of golf. <laughs> That's what I hear. All right. Um, So you mentioned, uh, you know, you mentioned VCs in there and that's actually something we're going to get into as well. Um, So I'm just going to I'm just going to skip ahead and let's talk about native voice. What is native voice? Yeah, so native voice, we're a software company and we build conversational AIs and voice assistants and we connect them to our software, which today is on over a million audio devices in the market. And so we allow end users to talk to their favorite products, their favorite services without having to pull out their phone. That's a pretty, pretty simple explanation. Um, And we're going to talk about how you got into simple explanations um, here in a little bit. Um, (laughs) Can you tell us what the what's the problem that native voice is solving? I mean, like. I have Siri on my phone. Um, she sometimes does stuff. Uh, what's uh, what's what's the what's the problem that you're that you are fixing with this product? Well, I'll start with the problem you mentioned. Is uh, a lot of the voice assistants, um, as we call them, you know, haven't been very good. Um, you know, people say, "Oh, you know, Siri doesn't do a great job," or Alexa, you know, it's not that smart. And so, you know, one of the problems that these voice assistants have had is they they try to do it all. And so by going a mile wide, they can only go an inch deep. And we've all had a kind of a lackluster experience. And so the first problem we're solving is for the end user, where when you want something on the tip of your tongue, you want to be able to say it and get it instantly. And you want it to work every single time. And so, you know, bringing that quality bar up to the expectation, I think, is job number one. But if we, you know, maybe kind of zoom out for a minute to the the higher level, the bigger picture, yeah, I think that we're moving out of the smartphone era and into what a lot of people call the ambient computing era. And so I, I think we're going to look back at all of us looking down at our phones and photos of that and say, wow, that was a, a really you know, strange time. And so at the highest level with human communication, we have two eyes, two ears and a mouth, and that's how we communicate with one another. You know, even in this conversation, there's some visual communication through body language, but most of the communication here is, is audio. And so I think it's strange that we've been interacting with computers using our fingers for decades, uh, you know, with mice and keyboards and touch screens. And so if we fast forward this movie, you know, five years, 10 years, 20 years, you know, I believe that we'll have a, a seamless experience across, you know, all of our brands, all of our services, where you'll be walking down the street, wearing a pair of headphones, be able to call up a particular service, a particular, you know, product, whatever you might need, be able to get in your car, put your headphones away, pick up that same conversation right where you left off, get home, walk in the living room and the same thing. And so I think we're moving out of this era where the smartphone is the center of the universe and we're all going to have more devices in our lives, whether those devices have screens, microphones, uh, speakers, but all of those devices will interact with in a more natural way in a, you know, head up eyes and ears open experience. And so that is the the big problem that we want to solve or, or we want to enable. But we've got to start with, uh, you know, the small steps. And so, um, you know, we can kind of unpack that here in, in greater detail. But, you know, we want to be able to enable this future of computing, this ambient experience. So we're all, you know, untethered from this little window into our digital experience and have our digital world combined with our physical world in a seamless, natural way where, you know, you don't even really notice it. It's there to serve you. You're not always having to be, you know, in it. 
Right. And and yeah, just like what you said, we're going to unpack this um, a lot further. I have I have a lot of uh, cuckoo thoughts on this that uh, that I need you to disprove for me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and we're just going to we're going to we're going to go down that rabbit hole here in a minute. Um, but uh, what I want to do before that is you mentioned uh, VC. Um, and I know that for native voice, you, you raised, you know, you raised some funds, uh, through VC, um, and in the, in your profile, uh, which people can find over at startupsavant.com slash podcast, um, you mentioned an interaction with a potential investor that, um, that maybe was going good and then maybe it wasn't going good. And, uh, maybe they just had a little bit of a hard time understanding. Can you, can you tell us the story of, of uh, this investor? Um, so I think the investor you're speaking of is actually, uh, back with, uh, my first company idea paint, but, uh, it was actually pretty, uh, uh, interesting and tell me if this is what you're thinking of, but you know, I, I I'm there with, uh, the VC, I'm nervous, give my pitch and you know, they're loving it. They go, oh my gosh, absolutely. This is the best idea ever we're in. And so, you know, we keep, you know, having a discussion going on and on. And so, uh, my, my first company, um, I invented dry race paint. So very briefly, if you were written on a whiteboard, imagine having paint that you can, you know, paint on your wall and turns your wall into a giant whiteboard. And so as I'm giving my pitch, the investor stops me and goes, hold on, wait, you make paint you can write on. I go, <laughs> yeah. And he goes, oh my gosh, that's even better. We're definitely in. <laughs> I go, well, I just think to myself, you know, what, what were you thinking about? you know, that I did before that. So, uh, this investor ended up not investing by the way. So, uh, I think that says a little something about, uh, you know, investors and how to judge reactions. But, um, yeah, it was interesting where, you know, I thought I was on the right track and then, you know, you find out that, you know, the investor's thinking something completely different. And so, uh, you know, that communication, just, you know, making sure that you can say it very, very succinctly and someone can get it instantly. Uh, is super important because uh, that's that's not just with investors, that's with customers and users, you know, all, all of the above. But um, kind of a, a funny uh, way to learn that lesson. So was that succinctness and clarity kind of the main lesson that you learned from this interaction? Uh, yes, and that uh, you know what I expected from investors is different than reality. Um, you know, a lot of times we can go into this as much as you'd like, but um, those that seem very, very enthusiastic in your first meeting, uh, a lot of times never respond to you again. Hmm. Um, I've had that interaction a, a number of times. So I think there's, uh, you know, some folks that are, are, are like that. Um, you know, there's other, uh, you know, folks who just ask questions and questions and more requests and it just never ends. And those investors are the ones that, you know, don't invest either. And so, uh, you know, what I've learned is, you know, one, you got to be in front of the, the right person, the right decision maker. Um, and if you are, they know if they want to invest within the first 10 or 15 minutes of meeting you. Um, yes, there's going to be diligence. Yes, there's going to be questions, but, uh, it, it's going to be, you know, very much them leaning in, wanting to, you know, spend time with you, not just, hey, send me this, send me that. Um, it's going to be more genuine interest. And when I look back, I can see that, okay, you know, that person was genuinely interested from the moment I met them. Um, it wasn't, um, you know, just uh, something that was too much or something that just seemed to be, you know, never ending, do this, do that, you know, fetch the witch's broom. And so uh, I think that was maybe an additional learning from that uh, that particular experience. That's a that's a pretty huge learning. It sounds like it sounds like you have a really good idea of what you know what to kind of look out for to see an investor that might just be fishing or you know wasting your time or something like that. What um, what changed in your pitching process or your communication process that has allowed you to? Uh, you know, parse those things out uh, to to have a a more efficient and effective raise process at this point. Good question. So it's um it's hard to tell, but yeah, I'd say for me, I run fundraising like a sales CRM, um, and a lot of folks do it this way. But um, 
you know, you, you've got to follow up, but if they're not getting back to you, they're not interested. So, you know, take them out of the funnel. But I think one mistake that a lot of founders make is, um, they raise money in you know, sequence. So they'll talk to a few investors. Some will say no, some will say they're interested and they'll, they'll talk to a few more. And you end up with this kind of elongated process where you're always searching for intros and you're taking the intro that you can get, you know, as, as you find them. And you know, I find that creates a, a problem where if the first group doesn't say yes, by the time you get down the line, you know, all the investors talk and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I, I spoke with John three months ago about this. And the risk is you start looking a little stale. And so if, uh, you know, people have heard that you've been out raising money for, you know, a little while, and now that becomes a, a new barrier. And so you got to create this, um, I guess what I'll call deal heat. And you've got to create this, uh, I got to have it. So this is back to what a lot of people talk about where, you know, greed, you know, fear and greed. Um, those are two pretty powerful, uh, you know, buttons in us as humans. And so the better way that one of my investors actually taught me more recently is, you know, one, do your homework, um, you know, figure out where there is a very good fit. And that way you're talking to a more narrow group of people who are more likely to say yes, but do a lot of homework, make sure that they fit your stage. They are interested in your space. If they invest in a company like yours before, you don't have to sell them on the market. Um, for instance, you can get, you know, further, faster that way, but then, you know, ask for all your intros and figure out who knows who, uh, you've got to get a warm intro and the best intro comes from another founder. Um, you know, that founder that, you know, they've invested in, they trust, they say, yeah, you got to talk to this John guy. That's best. Um, but your advisors, your investors, um, you know, your bankers, um, you know, do a great job of making those intros. But line them all up and say, okay, next Thursday and Friday, you know, I'd like everyone to send their emails. And so that way they all go out at the same time and you get everyone back. And now you have the investors all talking, saying, oh yeah, I'm talking to John tomorrow. Oh, I just talked to him. Oh yeah. And so it starts to feel like the deal is hot. Yeah. And you know, that's part of the problem in raising money is the longer the investor waits, the more it is to their favor because they can see the next card. Maybe you're running out of money and going to get more desperate. And so there's not a lot of reason to invest now. And so creating that deal heat of, um, you know, being able to get to that first term sheet, that's, that's the big hurdle. Um, uh, I call it term sheet hell, um, uh, <laughs> until you have that first term sheet, uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, trying to create that heat. But then once you have that first term sheet, you want to have enough people who you talk to or familiar with you, where you can call up and say, Hey, I've got a term sheet you know, I, I love you, you know, would you love to, you know, join the round or offer a competing term sheet? And before you know it, you'll have, you know, three, four or five, you know, like my last round, six term sheets. Wow. Um, you know, all at the same time. And so, um, you know, that was a different day. That was like, you know, a year and a half ago where the market was different, but, uh, you know, just creating that deal. That's a, a process that I learned more recently that has uh, been a, a big improvement. And, um, you know, my experience. So if you get multiple term sheets, is it kind of like you have pick of the litter or can you at that point, like create kind of like a, you know, highest and best offer type of situation? Can you pit them against each other and kind of create some competition between the different investors? Uh, yes, that's, that's the idea. Um, what I like to do is increase the size of the round. Okay. And you know, let, let's make this a more of a party, um, where, yeah, you know, you'll hear this from others, but uh, yeah, I've never talked to a lot of founders that said, "Oh, I, I wish I didn't take the money." Um, you know, it always takes longer. It always takes more, and so um, you know, you can't do this with everyone in the group. Um, you do have to make some choices, and you want to create some competition, of course. But um, you know, this is at the end of the day, it comes down to people. A lot of uh, you know, there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of people that have money. But it's the the people behind that money that really build businesses mm -hmm. and help you build your company. And so uh, you may find a situation where you have an investor who's really good at this and can help you here, an investor that's really good at this. Um, so try to combine them. And so I've had a couple of rounds where, you know, my last company, I went out to raise 15 million and we ended up closing on 50. Nice. And so uh, just to be able to, you know, kind of upsize it you know, try to float the valuation with that, but, um, you know, use some of the momentum you have to, um, you know, to do more. Cause I, you know, I think that, you know, with, a a startup, it's, uh, these things are binary. They're ones or zeros. 
and you want to make sure you get to the next milestone, get to the next stage. But, uh, you know, be, be careful about valuation. Um, you know, you're setting expectations. So uh, if you uh, start going too far with it, you're kind of uh, getting yourself into trouble because you're setting a bar that's too high to achieve. So, you know, as you do that, you just have to be realistic of what you can really get done so you don't paint yourself into a corner. Well, and I think we're seeing a lot of companies that kind of have painted themselves into a corner. We're, you know, we're hearing with with all this uh, this banking stuff that's going on and and the risk free rates of, of return being so high that we've seen um, we've seen valuations like really, really fall. Um, and some people yeah. say that that's kind of like falling back to reality. And some people say that it's just falling. Um, but with all that being the case, what are the things, the specific things that you feel like you're going to need to change the next time you, that you go to raise another round? Yeah. So from my perspective, it's, it's been healthy. Um, you know, I'm one of those that's falling back to reality. You know, it was a fun 10 years yeah. when, uh, you know, money was free and you could raise, you know, a hundred million dollars for a flying car, you know, pretty incredible ideas, um, that you could get substantial capital for, but, um, you know, we're getting back to fundamentals. Um, you know, this is about building a real business, you know, what's the revenue, what's the profitability, what's the customer base, what's the growth rate. And so that certainly is what the market is looking for is those fundamentals, those, those growth rates, um, you know, show that you have, you know, product market fit, real customers, um, all of those things that really are foundational for, uh, for a business. And so, you know, what I if you know, told other founders and the way I think about it is, uh, you know, valuations have, have fallen. And I think that there's a lot of founders that are clinging to that old valuation and haven't really come to grips with the, uh, the new reality. And, you know, it's, it's the, it's the number at the end that really matters. Um, you know, the, the valuation on paper, you know, you, you can't go to McDonald's with your uh, founder stock, um, you know, and, and buy a cheeseburger. It's, it's the value at the end that really matters. So, um, you know, my, uh, you know, focus and suggestion has been focus on the valuation at the end. And again, you know, these companies are winners or losers, you know, make sure you're on the winning side, make sure you're a one and not a zero. And, you know, take a realistic valuation because there's a lot of companies that are waiting. And I think we're going to have a flood of fundraising here you know, later this year, as companies start to run out of money and they start getting desperate. And so uh, if you can raise money and try to do it to get yourself, you know, well into next year, you know, even 2025, if you can, um, because, and then do it at terms that are, are reasonable. Um, one challenge I've run into in the market is VCs don't want to upset their friends by giving a down round. Right. And I think there's a lot of founders in that situation where if a VC wants to do the deal, they'll do the deal, whether it's you know, down round or not. But you know, there is some hesitancy around, oh, I don't want to get involved in a down round. And, and I understand there's some complexity around um, you know, a lot of things on the cap table when you, you do a down round. But um, you know, being able to kind of reset your valuation back to reality, if you have an opportunity to do that, I think it's uh, in your best interest because now you're at, you're at a point where you can go exceed expectations and go raise a nice up round and, you know, be more attractive, uh, when you need to go raise, um, you know, your next round. So if you can try to get a, a round done at a reasonable valuation to kind of reset things, I think that's a better choice than trying to chase the up round and then, you know, finding yourself running out of money and, you know, being more desperate. Yeah. It's hard to operate without cash. That's for sure. Um, yeah, it's oxygen. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back to something you mentioned, uh, th back, you know, in these past 10 years, you, I think you said you could raise a hundred million dollars on a flying car. Um, but now I'm hearing, you know, back to basics. Um, let's, let's hit the fundamentals. Let's make a, you know, a, a solid, uh, profitable business, that sort of thing. And I want to ask you to kind of look into your crystal ball. And this is definitely not the last time I'm going <laughs> to ask you to look into your crystal ball today. Um, what do you, I mean, do you think that, that the fact that we aren't seeing as high evaluations or just the fact that, that money for these wilder ideas that may not make as much sense on paper until, you know, 
5, 10, 15 years down the road, new technology needs to drive them. Do you think that we are going to see a, a slowing pace of innovation as long as money is more expensive? It's a good question because I don't think having these big ideas get funded is a, is a bad thing. Um, I mean, it's an, it was an incredible time where you could get some big ideas that need a lot of capital, you know, funded. And, um, you know, I think those are some, you know, incredible opportunities. We'll see how many pan out, um, from the, you know, SPACs and other bets that, you know, were taken, but, um, you know, I, I don't think that we're going to see a slowdown in innovation. I think that entrepreneurs are scrappy. I think that, you know, innovation, you know, will continue to bubble up. Uh, I think the quality of that innovation will be higher. And so, you know, good ideas, you know, will get funded. Good businesses will get funded, but you know, we're going into, you know, an incredible time where, you know, we have new technologies that, you know, are enhancing our lives and are improving the way we do things. And so I think that we still have technologies, you know, like AI, like robotics, other industries, biotech that have, you know, quite a bit of innovation that has been built up from, you know, the university level all the way through that will continue to flow through that system. And so, um, you know, I think that, you know, there'll be less big ideas that get funded. Um, but I do think that we'll still see a high level of innovation. And I just think the quality of the companies and the quality of the innovations will, uh, you know, probably be, um, you know, just, uh, you know, a bit higher because there's, um, you know, there's not as much, um, you know, opportunity. You've got to really stand out to, to get to the top. I like the optimism. Thank you for bringing that today. <laughs> All right, um, I want to move into um, into the the thing that I'm just so excited about, and that's talking about AI and voice, and and really just kind of uh, trying to figure out what what this future is going to look like. And you know, we're going to go back to the crystal ball, and we'll probably both be super wrong, and the idea that will yeah. prevail is something that we could have never even imagined. Um, but, uh, but let me give a little bit of backstory on kind of where I'm coming from here. You all work in voice, um, voice as an input into many different, um, uh, mediums, technologies, devices, um, phones, smart speakers, uh, you, you know, cars, all that good stuff. Um, you know, in the mid 20 teens, smart speakers, I think it was 2014 that the first smart speaker was released. And then I remember specifically like 2016, 2017, that there were, there were two, um, holiday times that were like smart speakers were the thing, like go get a two pack of the Alexa kit or the Google box or whatever they were called. And I was pretty heavy in SEO at that time. And there was a conversation that was going on in the SEO world that people were scared, you know, SEOs were scared that the tide was shifting away from text search to voice search and that it didn't matter, you know, basically, you know, in SEO, you can be on, you know, uh, position one, position two, position three, and all those are, are fine um, because you're going to get traffic on any of those positions. But in a world where there is one answer to the one question, you have to be number one. And so people were really scared that everything was going to shift to voice. Um, and obviously that, that, you know, some of that shift has happened, but you know, now the, there's kind of a joke in the world that smart speakers have just become expensive kitchen timers. Um, <laughs> and so I now see, you know, you're here, you're making, you know, investments into innovations in this voice as an input space. Um, and so you clearly have a different vantage point into the world of voice. What do you what do you see as the future of voice? Yeah, so I agree with you that voice, um, you know, has become, you know, yesterday's news, uh, a bit stale, but we've gone through the hype cycle. And so I think what you just described there was the peak of the hype cycle of, oh my gosh, this is going to take over the world back down to, okay, this is a joke. And we're now coming out of that hype cycle. So when I started my company, I, I started, I started near the bottom of that, that hype cycle. 
it always takes time for the innovation to actually catch up to the expectation. And so what I find incredibly interesting is, you know, in the last six months, 12 months, we've seen conversational AI, which, you know, I'm hearing is kind of the, the new word for voice, you know, voice is old, conversational AI is new. It's, it's all the same thing. But, um, you know, now we have technical innovations that allow those devices to be much better. And so you mentioned it's an expensive timer. Well, yeah, you look at what people did with Alexa and Siri and, and Google, and it was pretty basic things. You know, what's the weather? What time is it? You know, play this particular song. But the capabilities of the technology were were pretty limited. And so I'll, I'll quote um, you know, an advisor of mine, um, Larry Heck. Uh, so Larry, if you're listening, hope you don't mind I'm quoting you here. But he said, you know, look, John, 10 years ago, the technology... Uh, innovation was that ASR, so speech to text, um, got to be better than 95%. And so for the first time, we could take what someone said and have a computer turn into text very, very reliably. And that is what gave us Alexa and Siri and some of those other innovations. But now we can understand what the person meant. So what is their intent? What is that really, you know, what's the essence of what they're asking for? And so when you experience talking to, you know, Alexa, for example, you know, you would ask things and, you know, she wouldn't be able to do it, um, didn't understand, or I can't do that. And so you have this kind of categorization where, you know, they're trying to get you into a category so they can actually get you deeper to understand the use case that you're going after. But now we can actually understand at the top level. And so I think that you'll see here you know, in the coming months and even years, um, you know, probably faster than years, but uh, you know, just a, an, an incredible increase in the capability of a voice assistant. And so, you know, yes, those uh, smart speakers have kind of become, you know, yesterday's news, but I think they're going to be getting some pretty incredible capabilities where, you know, you can ask for something throughout your day. If you think about all the apps on your phone and, you know, opening your, you know, unlocking your phone, going to the app, trying to find the thing you want, you know, just to be able to say it, and get it, um, you know, I think that's the future that we're headed towards, but we've been living through that hype cycle and they're now on that upslope where the technology's caught up to fulfill the, uh, the expectation. Yeah, I think that, you know, seeing seeing voice as being the the entry model into finding different things on the phone, it, it's, it's always been interesting to me to see how people use a thing or how people find a thing. Um, the CEO of this company, and he loves it when I tell this story, um, he always used to go to these conferences and and people would say, what do you do? And he would say, do you have a phone? And, if, and the people are like, of course I have a phone. He's like, I'm a human. <laughs> and so they'd pull out their phone and they and he would say, OK, look up this, you know, this term or whatever it was. And this is where the interesting thing started for me, because I got to, you know, witness so many of these different um, interactions. And some people would pull up a browser and they would type it in the browser. Some people would, you know, click on the little um, the the like widget or whatever, uh, the Google widget and type it in there. Some people would say it into their phone. It was just really interesting to see the different ways that people interacted with the technology uh, to achieve the same result, um, which actually I think is going to bring us back around to ambient computing, which you mentioned earlier. Could you give us kind of a, a tidy definition of what ambient computing is? Yes, and I want to go back to your uh, comment, but um, ambient computing to me is the ability to interact with compute power throughout your day seamlessly on multiple devices. And so for me, it's, it's not having a, a window into your digital world in your pocket. Yes, I think we'll have displays, uh, you know, in our pockets. Um, we'll have more displays in our life, but the technology is fully integrated, you know, into our life. And so you're able to, you know, within arm's reach and within, you know, um, you know, a simple word, be able to get what you want when you want it. It's intuitive. It's responsive and it kind of fades into the background. And so the technology is there to, to serve you. You're not having to reach out to it and find it and grab it and pull in the thing you want. It's you know simply available to you. 
And it's not calling for your attention. It's there at your service. And so I think there's a, a shift in my mind when it comes to ambient computing is yes, the availability, but also just the interaction uh, that we have with that compute power. I I agree, and I've and I've got some I've got some more thoughts on this. But you mentioned that you wanted to go back to my. Uh, do you have a phone comment? Oh, well, you know the way we think about it, and I think about it is you know in terms of cognitive load. So cognitive load, you think about any task that you do, you know, on your phone or elsewhere. It takes a certain amount of physical energy and a certain amount of mental energy, and so. I think that people will choose the path that gives them what they want with the least amount of cognitive load. And so, you know, there's a cost for switching and a cost for learning. So, you know, with a lot of things, you'll swipe open your phone and just go do it, even though you can do it on voice and it's easier, but Delta isn't big enough. And so I think there's gotta be a big enough Delta between the old way and the new way. And that new way has to be so much easier. It has to be less cognitive load for you to make that change. And so that's how I think about in terms of your, uh, your comment around, you know, lots of people do things in different ways. Um, you know, I think that we will gravitate to the, to the way that is, that is easiest, so long as the delta is greatest. But I also think that it's, uh, it's generational. And so I, I look at, you know, kids, you know, they're much more likely to interact with a voice assistant. Um, I look at my mom, you know, she doesn't know how to turn Bluetooth on or off on her phone. She only knows how to do it through Siri. Right. Because, you know, our generation got smartphones when we were uh, you know, old enough to use them. And so we know how to go to the settings and find this and find that. But, you know, for my mom, she never learned the settings. She just did it through through Siri. Um, and so I also think that we have a, a generational shift where, you know, we have that switching cost because we know how to do it and doing it the new way needs to be that much better. But, you know, for people who never learn the old way, they're going to start out with the new way, you know, off the bat. So I do think that we'll see this throughout a, you know, this shift over a generation. All right. So here's where, here's where I want to get wild. Um, if we want to think <laughs> about specifically just cell phones, not even like computers or TVs or radios or any of that, just cell phones, you know, in the, they, they, they truly, they truly act as an, an interface medium between humans and technology. Um, and this has been a, a, an evolving thing since, you know, original cell phones in the eighties had number buttons as, you know, as an input and they, and they had sound as an output in the two thousands, uh, maybe in the late nineties, it became, uh, you know, the, the, the input was still buttons, uh, and it was still number buttons, but the output became kind of a low resolution screen where you could see your contacts, you could play snake, uh, you know, you could do things that you needed to do on a tiny little screen. Um, obviously when the iPhone came out in 2007, um, and the input was changed to a touch screen, which allowed, you know, for full color and a large enough screen that you could actually see things, uh, you know, the outputs became more visual in nature. Um, and you know, things really haven't changed a whole lot between, you know, that original iPhone in 2007 to what we have today, um, except for, you know, you've got things like Bluetooth and um, uh, other sorts of pairing mechanisms to where you can you can give a multitude of inputs into the device, but it's it's giving you largely a lot of the same outputs. Um, so all those words being said, what do you think is going to replace the cell phone as our main interface with technology? And and when do you think that this change is going to start happening? Oh, that's a hard question. Um, I mean, the, the short answer is I don't know, but, uh, you know, I, I think there's some really interesting things where, uh, you know, some of the folks over at Humane, um, are, uh, you know, there's been a lot of speculation over what they're developing, you know, some of the former iPhone developers that developed the, you know, the iPhone with Steve Jobs, um, you know, are, are, are advancing beyond the smartphone. But for me, I, I think it's a, it's a combination of devices. Um, you know, I, I don't think that the smartphone is going away anytime soon. I think that you'll have a display in your pocket that you'll pull out and, and want to, uh, you know, view things and interact with, um, you know, maybe there's other ways to do that. But, um, yeah, I think that you'll, you'll have interactions with more devices in your life. 
And so, for example, um, you know, Skull Candy headphones, like the device I'm I'm wearing right now. So we just launched on a million um, Skull Candy headphones in the market, giving those uh, devices access to voice assistants and conversational AIs. And so, uh, you know, in that experience, rather than pulling out your phone and pulling up your running app and finding your running playlist, you know, I think you're going to leave your phone in your pocket and say, you know, hey, Strava, you know, start my run. Hey, iHeart, you know, play my workout playlist and, you know, you'll be off. And so, you know, as you're, you're running or you're doing other things, you're not going to want to pull out your phone at times. I mean, there are certain things that are certainly best for visual displays and other things that are best for audio interactions. But uh, I think that we're going to have, you know, more, you know, higher availability to those services that, you know, give us what we want. You know, the, the apps on our phone will start to be available in more places. Um, I think you'll get in your car and you'll be able to ask your car, you know, how many more, um, you know, miles until I, I need a charge, um, you know, turn on the, uh, windshield wipers, but also be able to ask things that are outside the car, you know, Dunkin' Donuts, you know, have my coffee ready. Uh, you know, my favorite here at the next exit. Um, and you know, like magic, you'll walk in the store, I'll be ready for you. And so just making those systems that are, you know, some of them are available today, you know, others are getting built and, and being improved, but making those available. And so that's been the, the core of native voice. And, and what we do is, you know, of course, helping brands build their voice assistant or their conversational AI, like we did for, uh, for iHeart, um, like we're doing for, uh, the largest audio library in the country and one of the largest weather companies in the country, you know, building out that interaction and helping them. But lots of people will build inter interesting, you know, conversational AIs and, and you know, voice uh, interactions. But being able to make that available and seamless on your device. And so like we did with, with Skull Candy, you know, being able to have the availability of, you know, any of the services, um, whether you're a, a Google user or an Alexa user, or you want to talk directly to iHeartRadio because their service is better and does a better job at giving you what you want. You know, just having that available is, I think, uh, the shift that, I think we'll likely to see, and I think we'll see that, you know, it's happening right now. Uh, I don't think we're going to wake up in a month and our phones are going to be obsolete. I think it's going to be a progression over time where we start getting more devices. They have more capabilities, but I have a hard time imagining in five or 10 years that, you know, we're all going to, you know, get on the subway and everyone's going to be standing there just, you know, looking down at their phones, uh, you know, in the same way. So, um, yeah, I think that's, uh, you know, it's changing pretty, pretty rapidly. All right. So then, so you are you are working with um, with audio uh, devices and and audio as as an input. Do you? I mean, we obviously saw Google Glass um, kind of input and output in the uh, you know early two thousand tens or maybe it was the late two thousands. I'm not sure which, but clearly that didn't uh, go over uh, too well. Um, and so I think. But I, but I think that people weren't ready for that. And, 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 you know, this, this whole concept of like, if you are one step ahead of the game, then you're a genius. But if you're two or more steps ahead of the game, then you're an insane person. Um, so I'm about to prove that I must be an insane person. How long do you think until, you know, something like a Neuralink exists and the human race just merges with AI? <laughs> Uh, you have interesting questions and ones I don't have uh, great answers to, but, um, you know, the thing you write about is yeah, I had a, a smart investor tell me once he goes, John, you can never be late, but it's too expensive to be too early. <laughs> and so timing really matters. And, you know, in, in this company, I spent a lot of time, you know, working to understand, okay, is this the right time, you know, for this? But, um, you know, I, I do think that, um, you know, we are headed towards, you know, more, uh, you know, brain machine interaction. Uh, a friend of mine runs a company uh, in Boston called Neurable um, that can sense what you're thinking and mm. you can, you know, trigger different actions. Um, and so that technology is certainly there, certainly, uh, you know, happening. I think we'll start to see the beginnings of that, you know, here in the next couple of years, just, you know, knowing some of the folks and, you know, working on that technology and where their products are at. Um, but, you know, we're pretty far off from having a, a full, you know, human mind compute seamless uh, connection uh, in all of us. Um, you know, I, I don't know how long that will take, but uh, 
you know, I guess we'll uh, continue to keep an eye on it. Darn. I was hoping that by next <laughs> year I could be a, a cyborg who knew everything and would live forever. I, but I well, guess uh, the thing that you can, you can look forward to that is happening, you know, right now is you know with thing, you know the incredible work that's happening at OpenAI and other places with large language models is, you know, now we can use our personal data to get better responses, better interactions, and so I'm a big advocate of you know your data is your data, you own it, you control it. In fact, I think it will be one of our biggest assets. Uh, in the future, but you know, it was very hard to mine that data to really understand this is what the person you know wants. Uh, a lot of advertising companies and social media companies have um, you know done a good job of you know serving up things that are are relevant for us. Yes, but uh, when I look at that the recent revolution, the last six months, um, I think within the next year we're going to see a pretty incredible shift where our data, you know, with permission you know, can be, you know, made available to understand our preferences and what we want at a higher level that give us, you know, better interactions. And so when you say, you know, bring me a car, you're not going to have to put in your address and say it's an UberX and this and that, you know, it's going to understand these things. So it's going to be, you know, much more of an intuitive interaction. And so I think you can look forward to that uh, over the next year. I think that is uh, a, a step change in the technology capabilities that you know, we're all recently uh, been been discovering. All right. Well, I'll I'll reel in my um I'll reel in my insanity just a little bit so we can get back to reality. Um, what to, tell us what's next for for Native Voice? What's uh what are we gonna see in the next three or six or twelve months? Yeah. So super excited about our recent launch of Skull Candy. So we launched on Skull IQ devices. So uh, three devices in market. The push active the grind and the grind fuels and so uh those are in market now and then uh we do have additional devices coming this summer from skull candy as well so uh skull candy is the second best selling headphone in the country second only to apple uh which is pretty incredible but great products um great value so happy to be there i'm really happy that we recently launched uh hey iheart um and we built uh hey iheart it's exclusive to us uh, and we have a couple of additional, you know, big brands that, uh, you know, we all will, will recognize launching here in the coming months. Uh, but also this year, I'm really excited about launching a, an automotive accessory uh, with one of the largest retailers in the world. And so I think the automotive space is really interesting from a use case where when you're driving, you don't want to be looking down at your phone. And there's, there's so much that, um, you know, you want to be able to do when you're on the go in a, in a car environment. And so with uh, what's happening in the EV space, and I see a lot of the electric cars are going, you know, voice first as an interface um, and doing multi-voice. And so I think that's an exciting market for us. So uh, I think you can expect to see a, uh, an automotive accessory from us with, uh, or that we enable an automotive accessory from uh, a large retailer this year as well. What's multi-voice? Uh, yeah, sorry. So uh, multi-voice is the ability to talk to, you know, more than one uh, smart assistant or conversational AI on a device. So being able to uh, you know be listening to iHeart and midstream say, Alexa, you know, is my package been delivered yet? And Alexa will chime in and give you the answer and then kind of fade away without you ever having to skip a beat. And so just this idea of you're not talking to one, you know, one voice assistant, you're able to have this seamless interaction across multiple brands, multiple services. Gotcha. That's pretty cool. Um, so I, uh, I ride a motorcycle when the weather is good enough here in Ann Arbor. So about three days out of the year. Um, and, uh, obviously I don't have hands, um, for, for phone access. Um, and even voice might be, be kind of difficult, but, um, I recently just bought a, um, I believe they're called a Cardo, uh, voice audio it Bluetooth to my phone, that sort of thing. So, uh, Maybe, maybe here in the next couple of years, we'll, uh, we'll see some native voice on my little Cardo in my helmet. Um, and then of course there you can you work on the heads up display on the inside of my visor as well. And then, and then <laughs> that'll be pretty fun. Well, yeah. <laughs> we'll get right. We'll get right on. Have Cardo give us a call. We'll, we'll start there, but I'll, I'll uh, yeah, let him know. Of, we, we got a lot of, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm going to ask you my favorite question. What is your number one piece of advice for early stage entrepreneurs? So, you know, I, my, I guess mine would be, there's a lot of advice. I've made a lot of mistakes, uh, probably too many more than I'm uh, willing to, to admit. But uh, my biggest advice I think is, 
you don't fail until you give up. And so, you know, when I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, um, you know, they say, oh, well, the market changed or this happened, this happened. And, you know, yes, you got to pivot. Yes, you got to change. But, you know, these companies only go out of business because, you know, you run out of money and you give up. And so, um, you know, being able to figure out when you're doing the wrong thing very, very quickly and switch to the right thing, that's what this is all about. So, uh, you know, it's a, it's a trial and error process. But uh, as long as you don't give up, you know, you'll eventually get there. I think that is pretty solid advice. Uh, John, this has been a ton of fun. I've got one last question for you. Where can people connect with you online and how can our listeners support Native Voice besides telling Cardo to give you a call? <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, feel free to uh, reach out to me on you know LinkedIn or any of the uh, social networks. Uh, you can also give me uh, an email if you'd like, uh, jgosha at nativevoice.ai. Awesome. We're going to put all the links to everything that we talked about today at uh, startupsavant.com slash podcast. So folks, if you're looking for anything, you can find it there. Uh, John, thank you so much for coming on. I'm going to give you the last word. So you know, I, I think my last word for your entrepreneurs out there would be, uh, you know, f- find that first customer. Um, you know, that's what this is all about. It's about making someone happy, filling a need. And so, uh, you know, when you're thinking about your business and, and what you need to do and, and wake up tomorrow is, you know, find some someone, just one person that wants what you're doing and will pay you for it. And so uh, once you find one, you'll find two, you'll find 10, 100, 100,000 uh, that will come. So start with one. Um, it's really that simple. Uh, it seems daunting. And there's all these other things that people uh, get caught up in. But find one customer and Once you have that customer, everything else will build on top of it. John, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me. All right, that's going to be it for this week's episode of the Startup Savant Podcast. Thanks for listening. Quick reminder that you can help us grow the show by pressing the follow button. And I hear there's a little bell down there too. So if you really want us to grow, press that too. And hey, thank you. We will be back next Wednesday morning with another founder. And I know you can't wait because I can't wait either. Until then... Go and build something beautiful. The Startup Savant Podcast is produced by Truick.